On a day when we learned the Chinese want to buy Bellamy's for $1.5 billion and at a time when the experts are telling us to get ready to see value stocks make a comeback, I'll ask my experts to name names. What value companies look like great value? And if they can't name a really good value stock, I'll get them to name any stock that they think looks like good value right now. First up, we have Julia Lee from Berman Invest and Michael McCarthy from CNC Markets. Then Shane Oliver from a &B Capital will give us his best guess on the economy. Will it help or hinder investing going forward? Then Paul Rickard will chip in with his best value stocks. And then I will talk to the CEO of Clean Sea Seafood, who thinks he has a value company that is starting to float to the top and to success. Now, without any further ado, let's go to Julia Lee and Michael McCarthy. Well, welcome, guys. Um, look, I, I'm sure you've heard, particularly out of America, they're saying value stocks are starting to make a comeback after you know, growth stocks have been you know, dominating and whatever. So I thought today we could actually talk about uh, value stocks. It would have been a good idea if I warned you, Julia, but you're so smart, <laughs> you don't need any, any macro, of course, I gave him five months uh, notice. Now, <laughs> untrue, untrue. I actually told him 10 minutes before you. And he actually made the point. I've been talking value stocks. So just explain to my viewers in case they don't understand what a value stock is. What is it, Maka? So the idea behind value investing, Peter, is that we identify a stock that we believe the market has mispriced. That is, the company is worth a lot more than its current share price for flex. Now, there's controversy around this. We don't need to get into the academic arguments. Mm -hmm. And I'd also point out that value investing can mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. And as always, in choosing the investment, you have to take into account an investor's individual situation. So there are different ways mm. to invest within the value space. Yeah, and Warren Buffett calls himself a value investor, doesn't he? Absolutely, probably yeah. the world's most famous. And yeah. that's exactly what he does. He buys stocks on a long-term horizon, five to mm. ten years, mm. tries to identify undervalued stocks mm. uh, and hangs on for the ride. He's a business analyst first and foremost, yeah. and he likes to buy good businesses yeah. at cheap prices. Right, he buys businesses, not shares. Absolutely but right. Julia. Um, I guess having a look at value investing, and it gained in popularity because of Warren Buffett and mm. his success, um, and there have been a number of academic studies as well that uh, supported the idea of value over the long term. Mm. However, recently the type of value academic studies that we've had seen have been, you know, it's been a little bit more mixed. And I guess because there's so many schools of value at the moment, when we talk about value investing, I think it's useful just to contrast other methods of investing as well. And there's momentum, which looks at the growth area. Yeah. There's things like quality, and then you have value as well. And really over the five year, last five years, it's been momentum that's yeah. outperformed. But when you think of investing styles, styles come in and out of favour mm. together with the economic and the business cycle as well. Mm. So when you're seeing increasing growth and increasing inflation, it makes sense that growth and momentum momentum will outperform. But when there's a little bit more instability in terms of the mm. outlook, mm. then investors get a little bit more nervous and they don't want to pay those premiums for extra yeah, I'm not going to name names, but I'm sure you guys could name names. But I know when I, was, I started doing the TV show just after the GFC, there were a number of fund managers who really looked like they were absolute geniuses because stocks have been so smashed by the irrational fear of the GFC they can just go and say, well, the intrinsic value of this company is really is really high compared to the market price, therefore I'm going to buy it. And those fund managers, for a while, look like absolute geniuses. But I think after the global financial crisis, everything was intrinsically low. Yes, you could right. afford pretty much anything. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, but I guess in terms of times of uncertainty, value does tend to, to come into favour a bit more mm. than momentum and growth where there is a bit of uncertainty. So I think, look, this is the year where we've seen a lot of money going into bonds. And momentum, I think we're seeing a balance of between money going into momentum mm. and value at the moment, which okay. is pretty unusual. Um, the, the, the turnaround attitude towards possible, uh, for example, some people say it's time to get on board with value managers because they've had a real hard time for five or six years at, at least. Um, is it because there's a, a feeling that Trump is moving towards a, the possibility of a trade deal and as a consequence those value stocks that have been ignored will be given a, a 
a time in the sun, McAfee? Well, that's a possibility, Peter, and one that investors can't afford to ignore. Yes, we could suddenly get a, a clearing of the clouds yeah. and markets could roar high. And it's very likely in that scenario, given how many uh, share markets globally are near all-time highs, mm. that when investors do pile back in, they'll seek those lower share prices. Now, I'm an agnostic investor, Peter. I'm not married to any particular side. I'm trying to work out what's going to work best. Married and agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a mixed metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. What I mean is I don't favour any particular style at any given time. Okay. I look for the style I think is going to be most appropriate for the next 12 yeah. to 24 months. And because I think what's going to happen here is investors are going to be forced into the market, they're much more likely to do it defensively. I think this is why property and utility have outperformed so strongly over the last six to eight months, and I suspect it's why value stocks will outperform over the next 12 months, because investors have been pushed into the market by low interest rates and a flood of money. Yeah. They're not keen, they're not optimistic, yeah. and that means they're more likely to buy lower share price stocks. Mm. Um, and so that's why I'm looking at value, but I'm, I'm They're being pushed up the risk curve, aren't they? You were saying they might just start in companies that look as though they've been completely ignored or bashed up for for bad reasons. And the other area that's often ignored or, or beaten up is the small cap space. Mm. And I suspect that could be an outperform over the next yeah. 12 months Julie, as well. what's your learned view? Do you agree totally with your client, <laughs> with your um, colleague, or do you want to disagree? I, I do agree. I guess um, opposing styles is momentum versus value. And when you're looking at you're momentum... You're a momentum girl? Um, it depends on where we are in the economic cycle. I still think Lately, momentum has yeah. uh, more legs because when you are talking about a resolution to the trade more, yeah. that talks of greater global growth. So that seems to be positive for um, momentum stocks. Where value comes into favour is when people are nervous about paying a premium for future growth, which yeah. is what momentum is, and they they rather, because of the economic instability and the outlook of the market, they start to favour more stable cash flows. Mm. Now, stable cash flows, if you don't have strong growth, are generally cheaper than the market. Mm. So those stable cash flows become more valuable as you face more uncertainty in terms of the economic outlook, the business cycle, as well as the extra volatility that's coming into the market. So okay. look, I think we're moving into that next phase. I don't think we're quite there yet. But that's why we're seeing, I guess, both styles being in favour at okay. the moment. I'm now going to ask you for some value stocks that you like, or any stock you like, because my, 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 um, yeah, my view is my view is like any stock that you guys think are good, good value or well priced. But I'm going to finish off with also what's happening with Bellamy's because that's a really interesting story. <laughs> so after being screwed by the Chinese over regulations for a long time, now the Chinese want to buy them. That's a very interesting development. But why don't we get you first, Maka? What are some of the, because you, you, you reckon you're always giving us value company. Well, for the last few weeks anyway. Yeah. But, but I do it from a top-down point of view. I look for a thematic I want exposure to, and then I look for value within that thematic. So uh, I've mentioned before that I like at the moment the standalone financial services groups. Yeah. And the ultimate value play if you want to be in a value play, is platinum asset management. Mm. Because its business is value investing. So if value investing does come back, mm. platinum could be a leveraged exposure. And to also them. Asia hasn't been good for them because mm. Asia's been a victim of Trump's trade war in many ways, hasn't it? Absolutely. They've mm. been hit by a number of global factors that are beyond their control. I still think their process is good. I don't think it hangs on a single individual, as some do. Mm. Uh, and I suspect that they're due a big bounce. And the other one in that space that I like is Challenger Financial Services, mm. which I've mentioned a few times. Mm. You've missed the boat at 660 if you didn't act two weeks ago when you're watching the Switzer TV report. Yeah. But uh, Of course, the market moves when you say this <laughs> on Switzer. So, yeah. Correlation's not causation. <laughs> uh, but up at $7.30, I still think it represents a value play. So there's two with a top-down thematic and, and a value approach. What, what's also interesting, I, I showed you a chart that was actually in the Fin Review, I think, on the weekend. Financial services businesses have done well since there's this talk about a trade... Um, agreement being a possibility as well, hasn't it? Well, clearly, financial groups are leveraged to the, the broader economy. So if the broader economy is going to do well, financial stocks okay. probably will as well. All right, Julie. She, she made her, her little smiles where she, you know, she doesn't <laughs> totally agree, but she's not going to be nasty enough to say, I don't agree. There's plenty of room for so honest So what was that smile about, Julie? No, I was just thinking a bit more deeply about value stocks, and I guess you could put them into three categories. One's value traps, and that means that there's possibly more downgrades on the way mm. that are going to hurt before there's maybe any good news, if you ever. Know one of those? 
One, one, yeah. <laughs> one that comes to mind is Speedcast. It's been downgrading again yeah. and again. Fletcher Building is another one that's mm. been downgrading for the last four or five so years. So that could be a value trap, I think. Yeah, so yeah. I like to see, um, I guess, either a cyclical uptick because certain stocks can get, um, I guess, sold down heavily because of cyclical conditions like drought. So New Farm is one that I mentioned uh, a couple of months ago and that seems to have seen a bit of support. The other area is where there's mispricing. So the market's being too pessimistic about its outlooks. And um, I guess one that I've mentioned before is Eclipse. I still mm. like it. I think as its problems sort of fade and its financing problems fade into the background, it's going to be repriced mm. on its, uh, I guess, its core business and its stronger balance sheet. So I think Eclipse is still looking good. I've supported it for a number of months, but mm. I still continue to support okay. that one. Okay, before I go to this final subject, is there any other value stock you'd like to share with our, t our viewers? They, they hang off every word you guys say. You know? Well, I've got a couple that fit both the uh, small cap thematic and the value thematic. Um, okay. Once again, though, it's a top-down view. East Coast gas in, in Australia is very, very expensive at the moment. One of the key reasons for that is the locked-up supply in Victoria and New South Wales. I believe regulation has to change, and there's a big political push on in the energy space at the moment. So I've got a couple of small cap stocks that have exposure to the opening up yeah. of gas. So that's, that's a gamble. If, if politicians give in on this, these companies will have a nice... Day in the sun. Absolutely. So groups like Comet Ridge and Vintage Energy have got good exposure. Vintage Energy. Vintage Energy. Yeah. VN's the code. Yeah. Um, and COI is Comet Ridge. Yeah. Um, now there are eight or nine eligible companies here and investors yeah. have to make up their own minds if they want exposure to this theme and how they would take it, which companies they'd like to be involved in. But uh, nonetheless, I, I, that sort of ticks three investment boxes for me. Value, small cap and the um, top down thematic. Okay. Now. I'm really brave, yeah. but I'm going to be brave. <laughs> Clydesdale, I think maybe is one, you know, if you bought now, so we're, good, pump for you. we're good in three yeah. years. Well, the problem is that they had a deadline, which was the 28th of August, which was for people to put in a claim for the missold PPI insurance, which was yeah. the insurance sold on credit cards and short, mainly short-term products yeah. that they didn't necessarily have to sign up for, but thought they had to sign up for to get the product. Ah. Um, that deadline's passed, and we did see another downgrade um, due to more claims than expected to come out. But when you see a downgrade cycle, I ask, you know, is the worst of the bad news over? So that deadline's now passed. So possibly mm. over the next 18 months, we could see mm. business becoming more uh, like normal. And look, falling interest rates is a negative for the banks, but I think Clydesdale's just gone too much the other way and being oversold. Okay. All right, now, last one, Bellinix. Um, they have had their own internal problems. We know that there's some sort of craziness between the CEO and chair a few years back, but they really, whenever they have looked as though they were on a roll, all of a sudden there'd be some sort of Chinese regulation that kind of knocked them for a six. And now the Chinese want to buy them um, and its share price has gone up. Um, I noticed that Blackmore's has gone up as well. This is another company <laughs> that has suffered Chinese regulations. Is Blackmore's a value company that could be on the way up again? Oh, look, I think sometimes I put Blackmores in the area of fads and tricks. Mm. And that's because when you look at um, health trends in Asia... It's a very unusual Asia, category. I've never heard you mention before. <laughs> Did you make that up straight away? Or, or you know, I, I do have an Asian heritage. <laughs> and, um, you know, Asians do have a habit of getting in on a health fad. So yeah. whether it's royal jelly, manuka honey, or even Tasmanian honey, yeah. or, you know, vitamins, these things seem to come and mm. go. So there seems to be a trend. So if Blackmores is out of favour with its vitamins at the moment, you can be sure that it's not all health products that are out of favour. It's just that it's had its time in the sun and something else is probably shining. You know, I've been through aloe vera, extra oxygenated water, manuka honey, you name it. Don't they no, sell I've seen the <laughs> Okay, that's a good, good point. Wait a minute, well, wait a couple of things out of Bellamy's, Peter. First of all, if you want to do business in China, you must knock on the front door. Mm. One of the problems for Bellamy's was their initial distribution was through the Daegu's, mm. these private individuals who were shipping into China, and they didn't have an official licence to, point. To, to put uh, product into China. Now, the Chinese authorities don't like that approach. Mm. They don't want people going around them. And I think one of the reasons they've had so many issues around licensing was they didn't go about it the right way. Mm. Now, in finding a partner on the ground in China, and it is a takeover, there's no two ways mm. about this, mm. there is real potential for them to expand their business. Unfortunately, a bit too late for shareholders in mm. Bellamy's. They'll likely be taken out by this bid. But um, that's... 
that's one of the key lessons for Australian companies. If you want to do business in China, you must go through the front door. Mm. The second is, there are different styles that work at different times, and Bellamy's was in a downgrade cycle. So if you, know, if you didn't buy this because it was a value stock, it potentially missed out on a 50% gain today. Yeah. So it doesn't always work that way, of course. Not every stock's going to be taken over. But let's remember the Aussie dollar is sitting at just below mm-hmm. 69 US cents yeah. compared to the dollar 10 we saw three years ago. Australian <clears throat> stocks look cheap, and it's another reason to mm-hmm. be in the value space. Yeah. So one last thing then, Blackmore's. What do you think? Then? I'm not a fan of Blackmore's business overall, so I'm not a great judge. I'm biased against mm-hmm. it. However, I do not. It's one of the top three performers today, and it was very clear mm-hmm. a number of traders were drawing a line between the Bellamy's takeover yeah. and the potential for a Blackmore's takeover. Yeah. Okay, good point. That's, of course, Michael McCarthy from CNC Markets and Julia Lee from Berman Invest. Coming up after the break, we'll be talking to Shane Oliver from AMP Capital. I caught up with Shane Oliver late last week and I just wanted to ask him what he thought about reporting season and also about the economy as well. Shane, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Let's talk about the um, reporting season so far. Someone said to me it was one of the worst reporting seasons in a long, long time. Do you see it that way? Well, it was soft. It it probably wasn't the worst because profits did still rise. So you can't quite say that. Mm. Um, This is not 2008, 2009, also a few years ago, we had a negative in there. In terms of upside surprise, it it was pretty disappointing. Um, There wasn't a lot of upside surprise on my count. Mm. Um, and there was, I think, the lowest number of companies reporting profit growth. It was something like 58% reporting profit growth, whereas normally the norm's much higher than that. Normally yeah. the norm. No, normally it's much higher yeah, than that. I like that. And, and that, the that norm. made it, it sort of, I, I think it was one of the softest since about 2012. Yeah. So th- there's no doubt it was a little bit on the soft side. Interestingly, though, you've got to sort of wonder, well, why didn't the share market fall out of bed yeah. in response to those results? Um, in fact, we saw the normal... Uh, situation where just over 50% of companies saw their share price rise the day mm. they reported. I think the reason for that was that the market was a bit more forgiving. The market said two things. Well, you know, we've got uh, very low interest rates here. I can get almost 6% out of the, out of yeah. the share market on a grossed up basis with, with franking credits. And I can only get uh, 1.65% out of a one-year term deposit. So, mm. well, that supports the share market. Secondly, I think there was little snippets in there Mm. which provided a sense of optimism. JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, Woolworths. Yeah. So uh, retailers doing retailers a little bit better. Retailers saying, yeah. well, yeah. things might pick up a little bit. There's mm. some anecdotal evidence that things will pick up a little bit, yeah. uh, that some of those tax cuts are being spent. Some of the home builders also said that they thought they'd seen the bottom in in housing demand, the demand for new homes. Yeah. So th- those things, I think, saw investors give the market. So they were forward doubt. looking rather than backward looking. Yeah. yeah. If you took on a backward basis, it was fairly soft. Profit growth was around, I think, one and a half percent. You strip mm. out the resources, it was about minus two percent. Mm. Not not so flash. But if you looked out on a forward looking basis, it was mm. it wasn't so bad. I, I know specifically there are a lot of companies that are rather insensitive to economic growth. But as the the index generally does it tend to either even with a lag be positively affected when growth is on the way up. And I know your view is that the second half of this year is going to get gradually better. Would, would some analysts say, well, if the economy is going to be stronger, some businesses like the banks, for example, they may well be better because it's just going to be a stronger economy? I think that's generally true. Mm. I mean, I look at it in a cyclical sense when the share market can see a stronger economy down the track, and yet interest rates are still low and inflation is still low, yeah. then that's the so-called sweet spot. Then that's a great time for shares. Yeah. But then when you get to the point where growth gets too strong, uh, the central bank starts slamming the brakes on with interest rate hikes, bond rates have, bond rates have gone through the roof, mm. share market valuations start to look terrible, and it then starts to get rough for the share market. Yeah. So m- my take is, We've been debating this one for several years now. Where are we in the cycle? Mm. I, I think we're still in something of a sweet spot yeah. where growth is certainly not boiling over. We don't have excessively tight monetary policy, mm. so it's hard to say we're at the end of the cycle about to come crashing down. Yeah. Um, it's more likely that we've got relatively soft growth, but hopefully things will pick up a little bit mm. and interest rates are still low. So that's why I'd, I'd say it's, it's still more of a sweet spot than being weighed down at the end of the cycle. Okay. 
um, the, the big switch into dividend paying stocks, uh, I think Paul Rickard's called them expensive defensive. I don't know if he stole that term, mm. but I do like it. Um, and defensive usually are expensive unless people are really panicking. If a trade deal comes along, do you, would you expect a rotation out of those sorts of stocks and into growth stocks? I think that would be inevitable. Mm. And to some degree, we've seen a little bit in the last in the last week or two where bond yields have gone up and that's caused the so-called expensive defensive, you know, the high mm. yield stocks to underperform relative to more cyclical plays. Mm. So I think we probably would see a bit of rotation if that were to occur mm. away from utilities, telcos, uh, well, real estate investment trusts, mm. and also away from health. Health is not a high yielder, but it is um, it is um, a growth sort of area. It tends yeah. to do well when there's <coughs> uncertainty about the broader market. Yeah. A- and other parts, of the more cyclical parts of the market, materials, mm. consumer stocks would do better. What about the banks? Well, the, the banks kind of are bought for defensive reasons because their yield's very high, but they also do benefit from a, a, an improvement in economic growth. So how, how do you rate banks? Banks are a hard one, I must Defensive admit. Defensive attacking. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're a, they've got a bit of both in there. They yeah, do have, pay good yield, so yeah. that gives them it points in time over the last yeah. decade or so. It makes them quite attractive because of their low yield, but they're also suffering to the extent that growth is low, so therefore their sales, their credit growth is weak. Mm. Now, if we go into a better environment, um, they may actually start to benefit because mm. the credit growth will start to pick up. But then they'd have to watch that rates don't go up so much that it takes away the, the yields mm. um, attractiveness of mm. them. So banks, I, I find a little bit difficult at present. Mm. But, but I guess if we get a trade deal and growth stocks and like mining stocks go up and banks go up, it could be good for the overall index, which has lagged America by a long way, hasn't it? It has. But if you look at it year to date, I think we're up something like 17% and I think they are as well. It depends mm, on the, yeah. the day you look at it. So mm. if you look at that period since 2009, th- this is the way I look at it. Look at the, mm. the, uh, say the ASX 200 relative to Misky World. Mm. You know, we've underperformed since 2009. Mm. And I think that was because in 2009, we started to rate, this was late 2009, we started to raise interest rates. The rest of the world wasn't. Mm. Um, we then had a very high Australian dollar, which held us back. Mm. We then had a mining collapse, a mining collapse, which held us back mm. badly. Yeah. Um, worries about the housing boom collapsing, keeping foreign investors away from mm. us. Um, and then the rest of the world had money printing and very low interest rates. Yeah. Now, now you've got the situation where the mining boom bust is fully over. That might, mining might be starting to strengthen a little bit again. The Aussie dollar is way down, so it's cheap. Any yeah, historic outperformance by our market is well and truly unwound. If anything, we've had 10 years of underperformance. Yep. And we've now got a central bank, which is a lot easier. You know, we're converging towards lower global rates. So all of those things suggest to me that the big underperformance by Australian shares that we've seen over the last decade is, is at or close to an end. Mm, okay. Last question. I always like to end off with an easy question for you, Shane. There are people since that, when? <laughs> since <laughs> since you're I always lied. trying to trap me. That's right. Since Last I decade lied. you've been trying well, to trap me. Well, yeah. This question, um, I know a lot of people are asking it, but there was uh, a story out last week from the American guy who picked the problems with the collateral debt obligations, um, and he reckons ETFs, exchange traded funds going to be the the cause of the next big financial crunch. Now, I think he's wrong. I think mm. I think some of those exotic ones, synthetic ETS, could get into trouble when, when any crash comes along. Yeah. But the solid ones that actually buy the index, they, they don't worry me so much. You wouldn't have ignored the issue. What's your take on it? My, my take is that most ETFs, you know, probably similar view to yours, mm. most ETFs are actually low risk because mm. they're an index. Yeah. So yeah, if you think back to the, uh, the resources boom in Australia, you, you think back to the tech boom in the US, they got into trouble because a certain part of the market went through the roof. You mm. know, tech stocks, yeah. resources stocks, and then you get this eventual correction or pullback or crash or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, that's not this. This mm. is people saying, well, I don't know which part of the market to go into. I'll just buy the whole lot. Yeah. Um, it used to be you'd buy an index fund. These days you buy an ETF. Mm on an index. <laughs> so I actually think it's consistent with more cautious behaviour on the part of investors. They mm. want exposure to the market, mm. but they're not willing to um, 
to, to, to sort of pick a particular mm. sector. They're not sucked into some view that this sector is booming relative to that sector. So in that sense, I'm mm. not too worried. I might get worried if I found that it was all geared. Mm. Then I'd get worried. But I don't think there's a lot of evidence no. that stock gearing is. But what about the, the fact we now live in an online world so it's easier for people to press the button on a cell mm. than it was when you had to go to your stockbroker. But on the other hand, I guess the fund managers in those days would have been loading up the cells. It's just, to me, it it's goes in the hands of individuals versus fund managers. Everyone, everyone's yeah. rushing for the exits when there's a crash. It, that, that is an issue. Yeah. That, and it's, a, it's a fairly fundamental one. Yeah. You can make an argument that economic volatility over the last 100 years has declined. Yeah. Now, prior to World War II, we used to have recessions every few years. Yeah. These days, it's every decade or so. Mm. In Australia, it's every three decades or, or yeah, more. We're, we're, we're so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so economic volatility has actually declined, but financial market volatility has actually increased. And the theory is that it's because we've be it's become easy to trade. Mm. So that that is a factor mm. that, yeah, people could head for the exits fairly mm. quick and they've just got to sell an ETF. They could do that pretty quickly and yeah. that could bring the market down. But yeah. counter to that is that you've got a whole bunch of funds which are set up market makers and so on that didn't exist in the past yeah. and that might inject... And they would be buyers in this And sense. they would be buyers in that environment. Yeah. So this, this is the problem with these sorts of things. Over my career and over yours, we're constantly told that there's some crash around the corner, that what we're seeing today is radically different to what we saw in the past. Mm. And yet in reality, perhaps it's not. There's mm. nothing new under the sun. All these things cancel each other out to some degree. We will get to a point yeah. where markets have gone too far and one day we'll get this crash down the other side. History mm. tells us these things happen. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I don't I mean, really know the fundamentals yeah. have changed that much. Yeah, and I guess if someone was saying the ASX 200 index, and it, and it would drop by a larger amount because volatility has been bigger, mm. the actual dividend, which is around 4.25% or something like that, wouldn't necessarily have to change very much. It might drop to 3.8 or something like that because the, in, the underlying businesses don't disappear just because That's right. the market crashes and mm. idiots have revalued a share price that was idiot in the first place. That's right. And that, mm. that, I think, is the key. Yeah. If, if I'm, say, like I'm 59 now, suppose yeah. I decide... Doesn't show that head of hair yeah, well, <laughs> do, 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 It's do gotten a bit color? Color. <laughs> Terrific. But suppose, yeah. suppose I decide I, I want to retire mm. and but I want income, I mm. want to live off some yeah. income. Yeah. And I kind of look at it like this. If I, I mean, you've always got to have some money aside and a yeah. reserve on the side to Buffer. fund things. But I can get a much higher income flow out of the share market with franking credits um, than I can out of bank deposits. Mm. The question for me is what is most important, getting a decent income flow or absolute security in the value of investment. Mm. Now, if you've got a, a big enough pool of investments, mm. You, you can probably argue that you should really just be focusing on getting that decent income because yep. history tells me that when you go through major downturns in the market, most companies try and maintain their dividends. They cut them a little bit. Yeah. You might go from 4.25 mm. to 3.8 or something. Yeah. Some might cut them a little bit, but most of them try and maintain their dividends because the dividend series is actually a smooth version of the share market as a whole. Mm. So reality is that you'd still keep getting the bulk of your income yep. flow, even though the market could fall 40 or 50% in value. Yep. In the GFC, it fell 50%. Yep. And history also tells us the market then recovers again. So if you're spending 20 years in retirement, yeah. you probably have a couple of these where it comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up. And then you could argue, well, the people who should be worrying about the, the value of your investment are actually your kids. Mm. You know, when the inheritance comes <laughs> along. <laughs> Good point. And you could argue, well, you sh it should not be something you should be yeah. overly concerned about, providing you've got a, a big enough balance in the first Well, that's place. why we started the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. And we got 11% gross up last year because of the dividends went mad because all those companies getting yeah, rid of their yeah. franking credits. But you're right, the, the, the idea of if you consistently getting 5 or 6% plus franking credits, as long as you can live with your capital going up and down, that 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 percentage flow is going to be pretty consistent. History actually supports History it. shows that it's it's consistent and yeah. stable, yeah. whereas the, the value of the investment will fluctuate, but it will go down mm. and it will also go up. Mm. And this is the problem with the nightly news. If you look at the daily movements on the share market, oh, no. It's 50-50 as to whether yeah. it goes up or down. And I think that's why you, some people have got to turn down the volume on the noise yeah. on the news. We're regular. How many times were we told last month that $30 billion have been wiped off the share market yeah, in one day? Well, the, the funny thing is that it went down 
30 billion wiped off. Then it went up, oh, down again. <laughs> Another 30 billion wiped yeah. off. Well, they didn't tell us about the recovery. And then yeah. We never heard about 30 billion being wiped back on, do they? We never heard no, we didn't one. hear about that. Or no. uh, right. the fact that it's gone up 17% year to date. Yeah. Shane Oliver, great to talk to you. My pleasure. Shane Oliver, Chief Economist, AMP Capital. Welcome back. My colleague Paul Rickard from the Swiss Report. I've asked him to nominate a couple of value stocks he thinks are overdue for a ride higher. Paul. Peter. Let's go. Well, uh, stock number one is uh, Link Administration. Now, Link uh, got up to about $9, been through a couple of tough parts the last couple of years. The first it's change. It's been Brexited, hasn't it? Well, the first change was pre Brexit, Peter. This is when the government announced some changes to the superannuation uh, that actually was going to reduce the number of super accounts. And they're some of their biggest clients, are people like Rest Administration. Uh, and Aussie Super is another major client who yeah. used Link providing the back office services. So that put some pressure down initially to Link. Then it did an acquisition, or had done an acquisition in the UK called Capita Services. It sold off a little part of that business. It had some challenges. It sort of got caught up in the whole Brexit debate. There's been some issues with one of the fund managers that they provided the sort of back office to. Questions about Link's uh, job as a trustee, and effectively like a trustee, and looking after the mandate that the investment manager uh, mm -hmm. sold. That's also seen some pressure. Been below $5 now, about five sixty. Still a bit of Brexit pressure to come, Peter, because yeah. the market has a habit of sort of, you know, shooting first and asking questions later. If we yep. get a hard brisket, Brexit, Link will be one of the stocks identified, and I guess that's still putting a bit of pressure on the price. Mm. But uh, it's about 20% below where the analysts think it should be reasonable value. So that's, uh, I think that's, sign. it has been a lot higher. The PE is still in the 20s, but I still think that's probably a stock that's... Well, it was uh, a real darling of the market. It was a real darling and couldn't do anything, anything wrong. And then, uh, as often happens in these things, you lose your darling mm. status and it's a hard road back. But yeah. I guess the market's sort of, you know, it's coming to that, that part in the cycle where there's always a, you know, swing back to sort of the, 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 the median type situation. Yeah. It's been so much growth, so much momentum. Mm. The value stocks have been unloved. And I guess this is one of the stocks that people are starting to look at again. Yeah. Uh, one thing I like, Paul, and this is something I'll, I'll share with the audience, uh, when I like a, a, the, the fundamental story of like a company like Link, I want to look at the technical side, namely what is the share price doing? Now, and if a share price hits the bottom and the starts to, to go up, that's my thing. I, I don't care if I miss the first bit of the rise. Do you think we're in that first bit of the rise or there's a little bit more before you get really Yeah, confident? look, look um, it has come back. It did go t temporarily below $5. It's mm. now about five sixty. so it's come well, back it's about, bit, about yeah. 10%. Seems to be finding a base here around about the five fifty mark, and mm. I think that's probably a good sort of base to sort of the next leg up. Yeah. As I said, you know, the Brexit is really going to um, play out in the next, or at least we're going to dominate our screens in October. And as I said, it would be impacted potentially in a hard Brexit, at least yeah. just in the way the market reacts. So yep. that's probably suppressing the price a little bit. But mm -hmm. I think there are, are more people starting to say there's value in Link. And uh, so I think that's one company to look at. And, and we often do say, uh, in, in case of lots of stocks, they often can sell, sell on the rumour of the Brexit. Yep. But when the Brexit actually happens, they buy it on the fact. So it, it's a very interesting case. What's your second one? Well, the second one is Blue, Sco Blue Scope still, Peter. Now, that's maybe not quite in the value category, but it, it was about $19. It, it's gone down to as low as the sort of ten fifty. It's now in the back around the $12 area, mm. partly because of steel spreads and uh, it had some pressure in, in the US. And, the, you know, when iron ore prices went up, the margin on steel got a lot tougher and there were also higher transport costs and the US markets had... Uh, you know, housing starts to come off the boil a little bit, so it's been caught up in some of that sort of pressure in the US market. Well, so Boral's had problems as well. Are yeah. Similar problems? I'm a bit... Look, Boral's a candidate, Peter. Um, it's been really badly beaten up. Yeah. I'm just not quite in the scope to give Boral a go yet. Yeah. I'm just worried... The, the stocks are probably a little more dependent on the housing cycle, the stocks mm. like Boral, Adelaide, Brighton. Just not quite there yet on mm. wanting to sort of put well, my we, money into we that. Well, we quite like but Adelaide Brighton, and it actually went for a rise last week, didn't it? Yeah, it, they, they, we've had a little bit of movement back, um, and this is what happens. I mean, things markets are cyclical; they can never go all one direction. And I think a lot of the markets suddenly woke up and said, "Well, hang on, you know, we've had this enormous uh, love affair with growth stocks. We've had an enormous uh, uh, backing of so-called momentum stocks." Things are really getting really expensive. Yeah. We've had some of the so-called interest rate defensives get super expensive, mm. uh, and the so-called 
you know, value stocks, which are the sort of the unloved, low PE yeah. stocks trading because they're generally in cyclical industries, out of fashion for whatever reason, often because they've uh, disappointed the market, yeah. uh, have been unloved and have really been struggling to find a way back. Anyway, you've been doing this a long time, Paul, uh, and the thing is, a market's assessment of a company is not always based on how good or bad the company is. No. It can be like, all right, that company's not doing well. I want to get out and go after pay. So I'll, just, I'll sell that company and get my money and go elsewhere. It's kind of like being treated badly purely because they want to use the money to buy something else. Peter, if we assume markets were rational, we'd be out of a job, <laughs> right? right? That's, Good point. That's, that's the real honest truth. Markets are just people and they're, it's all based on emotion. Yeah. And, and as much as we like to think there's a science and an art, it's more art than mm. science. And often the art runs runs goes so much further than we think. Yeah. And uh, you're exactly right. I mean, markets have a habit of taking things way too far and you can be unloved and mm. everyone can not want to touch you and you can be in love and the price just keeps on going up and yeah. up and up and up and up. Yeah. Eventually, you know, things do mean revert. Yeah. I think we're starting to see a little bit of mean reversion occur now. Yeah. And so, and, and sometimes, look, the Australian market just follows the US. We had this sort of, you know, value stocks have become a little bit in vogue in the US the yeah. last couple of weeks. Yeah. Everyone in Australia is now talking about value, value stocks. stocks. A little yeah. bit of mean reversion. Yeah. Uh, I don't think growth has been thrown away, but there are some very yeah. cheap stocks. And, and the bottom line is that a value fund manager goes looking for companies where the share price there's no relationship to the actual profits of that company. And that's with an opportunity. To yeah, go. and look, generally, a value fund manager is looking at all the fundamentals. So things are like price earnings, multiples, debt, uh, potential for earnings, growth. The specifics about you know, the company. You know, actually looking at the book value, price to book value ratios, mm. all, the, all the indicators you can get, you know, which mm. you learn about in the textbooks, that's what a value manager is doing and hoping that he can say, well, really, although this company is probably not going to do much, its share price actually should be 20% higher than it yeah. currently is. And I'm yeah. the smarty, and I can see that it can go up 20%. The company doesn't have to do much yeah. here. Yeah. It's just the market's got the pricing and, wrong. Right? And when the smarties do actually put their money in, that's when they go out of their way to talk to the media about what a great opportunity this company yeah. is. There are a lot of smarties right. out there who are very good at telling you what they've done. But, yeah. uh, they've, they've, but some of those smarties have been doing it pretty tough. I mean, conversely, I mean, companies like Afterpay and, and Zero, the so-called growth companies, they can't do anything wrong yet. Mm. They keep on going up, but... You know, they're, 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 people are paying huge yeah. models. WiseTech, yeah. we've talked about WiseTech at ad, ad nauseum, mm. reported brilliantly in the August reporting season, but it's just so expensive. Yeah. But, you know, the market it still likes it, despite yeah. last week's pullback. And some of these great companies eventually might be a victim of, oh, we made a lot of money there, let's take the profit and buy some of these value stocks which are really low price at the moment. And, and markets can turn like that because Rotation. every smarty is trying to outdo the next smarty and yeah. find a way to how they can make money and if they're making money it means someone doesn't make as much over yeah. here so well, that's what that's what it is don't assume markets are rational or logical they're not yeah and that's our smarty paul rickard for the switzer report coming up after the break we'll talk to a ceo of a value company david head who is the ceo of c of clean seas seafood David, thanks for joining us. A pleasure. Uh, we've talked before. You, you came into Clean Seas um, after a period of trial and tribulation. Tell us where the company is now. On pretty solid footing, I'd say. It's been a four-year program of transformation. We've rebuilt the business from its, the depths of the crisis after the, the feed problem when we lost nearly all our fish. Mm -hmm. We've built a new executive team. We've uh, got five out of six new board members. We've introduced branding to the company. Last three years, we've lifted our volumes 50%, and we've lifted our prices 25%. We've stumbled across, I have to confess, mm -hmm. uh, what we think is the world's best freezing technology, introduced it into our frozen kingfish products, and branded that sensory fresh, and we're launching it globally. Mm -hmm. So we think we're well positioned for the next three years of our, of our recovery story, which is all about growth. Okay, a lot of people, you know, wondering whether they should support, you know, your vision going forward, need to understand what happened 
to claim certain Absolutely. tuna because it has had fantastic uh, positionings in the market, the question marks and the problems, the new were brought in. Just in a nutshell, just tell us the story sure. and tell us why the worst of that is all behind and the, uh, the period going forward is going to look pretty positive. Indeed. 20 year history. <clears throat> Company sold it out, started out really trying to close the life cycle of Southern Bluefin tuna, which it did successfully. Mm. Japanese have been trying for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. This little South Australian company did it. The fish went to sea and were not successful. A couple of reasons, cold water, but at the same time we were experiencing a second problem, which was our mortality rates on the, on the kingfish jumped from a sort of seven year average of 15% up to 80% mm. over four years. And it turned out there was a deficiency an amino acid in the feed. And we lost 4,000 of our 4,500 tons of kingfish at sea. So you had no fish to sell. Yeah. It takes two years to grow this kingfish. My predecessor came in and really had the, the insight, the scientific expertise to identify the problem with the feed, sorted out the biology of the fish. And he and the team were, were, were given a pretty difficult job. You know, the company had lost half its employees, sold half its assets. Mm. The share price had dropped from $1.50 to one cent. Which is probably as low as it can go. It's not much, you not much more. I see you <laughs> the shutter door, isn't it? The market cap had dropped from $150 million to, to $7 million. And I think as you consider clean seas, one's got to say that in 2013, mm. at that point, the research and development phase of the company had not worked the way everyone expected it to. Yeah. And so there was a new beginning. And that beginning was, was, was made possible by my predecessor, Craig Foster, and the team. The team that I've brought in with me over the last four years, our job has been to rebuild those fundamentals. And as we said earlier, it's been a job of preparing the business for the next phase of growth. Do I think we're through the worst of it? Absolutely. Well, why do I say that? Well, because we've now got brands, we've got a, an outstanding product, and we've got some very exciting international market opportunities. When I joined this company, uh, I just had eight years of retirement when my wife was quite sick. Mm. And I came in here, I took the capital I had and invested a lot of it in this company. Today I'm the number six shareholder in a, in a shareholder of 7,000. Mm. So I've put my money absolutely behind the belief of the product mm. and the company. Okay, so the brand's always been good in, in the eyes of the consumer. The stock market might have a different view, particularly around 2013. But I guess the bottom line is uh, how do you grow this business to the next level? Because you've got some pretty big ideas, haven't you? Well, in terms of the branding, we've actually introduced a, quite a, a new branding proposition of the mm. business. It was always called Hiramasa Kingfish. Mm. Hiramasa is the species that mm. we managed to trademark in Australia. Yeah. We now refer it to a Spencer Gulf Hiramasa. So right. we're really giving a strong provenance story of the product. Yeah. The growth opportunities for us are very clear. In North America, which is 10 times the Australian market, we've got 1% of the market. It's a 76% frozen market, and we've now developed the world's best, we believe, freezing technologies. The Asian market's the fastest growing. It's growing at 30% a year, mm. and we've got 6%. In a Australia, we have 88%. In Europe, we have 45%. So we are, we're the clear market leader in the two very well-established markets. Our opportunity now is North America and Asia, mm. and we think we've got the product to, to penetrate those markets. And is the currency going to be an added uh, tailwind? It's, it's helping us right now. There's mm. no question about that. But this is a product that actually attracts a premium price. It's the most expensive fish sold to the Sydney fish markets for the last three years. Mm. And in most markets we operate in, this is the most expensive fish available. And it's not because we're inefficient. Mm. It's not because we're greedy. It's because the biology of the kingfish, which is, after all, the king of the sea, has a, has a metabolism that requires a lot of feed, two and a half times the amount of feed of an Atlantic salmon or barramundi. Mm. And when feed is 50 to 60% of your farming costs, it's an expensive animal. The reason brands have been so important to us, the reason we've invested in the world's best freezing technology, is because this product is an Aston Martin. It's not a, it's not a nice one series, two series BMW. Mm. It really is the best of the best. And the branding has allowed us to reflect the, the values of this product to the consumers, who are the, who are the top chefs around the world. Mm. And so we're very confident about the product's capacity to perform in any market in the world. Mm. And so whatever happened to Clean Seas Tuna? Well, we changed the name a few weeks after I last saw you in 2016, actually, yeah. Peter. We changed the name to Clean Seas Seafood Limited. Mm. And I think in a sense, it was the, it was the closing mm. of the door on an era that I think, is, as I said earlier, was perhaps best described as a strong, very extraordinary period of research and development. Mm. 
in which we'd stumbled across the, the, the kingfish uh, farming mm. uh, as a secondary project. And we mm. turned out now to be, we believe, the, the best in the world at this farming. Mm. So how are you going to really grow the business in uh, China, Asia, and USA? Much the same way we've done everywhere else in the world. Mm. <clears throat> it's about finding the right executive team to lead those regions. And we've just poached uh, our biggest competitor in North America, sales and marketing director. We've just taken about six months ago the guy who was the sales and marketing general manager at, at, at Huon Salmon right up to their float. Mm -hmm. He's brought with him the guy around international, so he's running Asia. Greg's running Australia, Europe and Australia and Asia. So we've got a good executive team to start with. We then find the right distribution partners in those countries, but we recognize that fishmongers and fish distributors, we're a small part of their business. Mm -hmm. We're a very high value part of it and we're a prestigious part of it. So we've taken it upon ourselves to go out and, and get to know and to meet the chefs, the food and beverage directors at the top hotels around the world. Mm. We've run a program over the last 18 months ca called Fish Act uh, the, the Chef Activation Program. And we've taken to 2,200 chefs who were not using our product a sample kingfish in a beautiful five kilogram box, mm. presented the chef and said, try it, let me show you where it's come from, a video on the provenance, and this is how we'd recommend you try using it. 40% of chefs who weren't using it have said they would use it definitely, and 49% mm. said maybe. Mm. Just 10% have said it's too expensive, doesn't suit my cuisine. So it's a combination of working through the distribution channels that are established for the supply chain, but going to the end users and demonstrating to them the value of our product and how to use it. You didn't risk Gordon Ramsay telling you to sod off. Well, Gordon Ramsay has actually has not told us to sod off, in fact, and we're actually listed and we're actually branded on his, on his, his menus in London, as mm. is Nobu and, and, and many of the top chefs around the world. And that's one of the attributes of this little South Australian mm. farm kingfish. It is considered, we believe, arguably the best raw fish in the world and on the menus of many of the top chefs around the world. David, good luck. Good story. Thanks Th for joining us. Thank you, Peter.